Aloha, I'm Dr. Bradley Wilcox. I'm a professor and director of research at the Department of Geriatric Medicine, uh, John A. Burns School of Medicine, University of Hawaii. I'm also an investigator at the Honolulu Heart Program at Kuakini Medical Center, where we study uh, healthy aging and longevity. I direct two large studies of aging, one the Kuakini Hawaii Lifespan Study, and the other the Kuakini Hawaii Healthspan Study. We look at factors that are important, both genetic and non-genetic factors that are important to living to a healthy old age. Now, one of the things we do in order to understand healthy aging is look at what we call longevity outliers, people that live uh, close to 100 years of age, centenarians or near centenarians. And you can learn a lot from, from these people because in many ways, uh, there are living examples of healthy aging most of their lives they lived uh, in a highly healthy and functional state. Um, one of the longevity outliers that so we're quite interested in is Madame Jean Camon. She lived the longest of any human ever. She lived 122 years. You can see a picture of her, her on the left when she was 20 years old, picture on the right when she was 120. And this lady was so healthy that at age 115 she was still riding a bicycle. So, we're quite interested in examples of healthy aging and longevity across nature because we can learn a lot uh, from what we call model organisms of aging or uh, study uh, models that are non-human. They share a lot of the same genes as us and a lot of the what we call biological pathways where genes are strung together and work together to produce outcomes like longevity. You can see in the upper left picture here, uh, Jonathan. Jonathan the tortoise. This is the island of St. Helene in the year 1900, and Jonathan was 68 years of age. It's pretty old. But when you see right below in the next picture, that's Jonathan over 100 years later. He's 176 now. He even looks healthier than he did when he was 68. You can see him moving around at least. In the upper right corner, you see a rockfish. Uh, they typically live in cold environments. This one was caught in the Bering Sea. And they live up to 200 years. This one was a fairly young one, only 115 years of age. In the bottom right, you see a Norway spruce tree. This particular tree is almost 10,000 years old. Now, for the true longevity outlier, the one that really uh, takes the cake, so to speak, this is the hydra. The hydra is a polyp-like creature, somewhat like a jellyfish, they live forever. They have a gene uh, that continuously renews their stem cells. So as long as they don't get eaten by a shark or a fish, or uh, they will continually reproduce their, their, their cells and, and renew their cells as they need to. So they're immortal. Now, what do these longevity outliers share in common? Well, there's a recipe for longevity. It basically consists of genes, environment, behavioral traits, and chance. Now, chance, of course, you can't do much about. There's a chance you could walk in front of a bus. Don't wish that on anyone, but that will shorten your longevity. So as long as you have good luck and you have decent genes, a fairly safe environment, and healthy behavioral traits like diet and exercise, you can optimize your odds for longevity. Now, what do we know about genes and longevity? There, there's two genes. One is called APOE and the other is FOXO3. We know these two genes are important in human longevity. And why do we know that? We learned this uh, through studies of long-lived people. But we also learned uh, through some of, these, uh, some of the, the new genes, like FOXO3, by studying what we call model organisms of aging. All the way from plants to yeast to fruit flies, mice, chimps, we all share common genes. And you, you can see, even with yeast, we share almost a third of our genes. Humans, we share 100% of our genes. We all have the same genes and we differ by 0.1%. We call those single nucleotide variants or just gene variants. And those small gene variants um, determine our characteristics, including um, how long we live. They have a big influence on that. Now, if, I'll give you an example. 
In the left side, you see yeast. In the right side, you see mice. They have a, uh, the same gene that's been uh, conserved, what we say, across evolution. We have it too, and it's a gene that makes you smaller, leaner, more metabolically efficient. And in humans, you'd think, well, does it have the same effects as yeast and mice? Well, apparently it does. This is a picture of a centenarian. Um, you can probably guess which one is the centenarian. I'm on the right, my twin brother's on the left, centenarian's in the middle. And this is a picture of an Okinawan centenarian. We have a large study called the Okinawa Centenarian Study where we regularly check the, the, the health habits as well as the genetics of these long-lived people. And we found that centenarians tend to have this gene uh, called FOXO3 that makes them shorter, more metabolically efficient, and they live longer. We also found this gene was overrepresented. In other words, it was more common to be found in the long-lived men in our Kuakini Honolulu Heart Program study. So if you live to be 95 plus years of age, you were more than likely a carrier of one of these protective genes. As we all know, we get one gene from mom, one gene from dad. If you had one of the genes from mom or dad, you had double the odds of living to be 100. If you had two of the genes, you had triple the odds you could go to Vegas with those odds. Now, we call FOXO3, this gene, a master gene in aging uh, because the, the gene, it's like a superintendent uh, and it's a stress resistance gene. So any perturbation in your body, if you're under stress or you don't get enough food, it tells all the other genes, maybe 50 or 100 downstream genes, what to do, how to protect the body. So it's a gene that really uh, keeps what we call a homeostatic balance. It keeps the body in balance and it protects it from, from too much stress, whatever the source of the stress. Now, obviously, it's not just genes that are important. Environment is important as well. When I, what I mean by environment is uh, your social environment. Do you have good social networks, your psychological environment? Are you a positive person? Can you deal with stress well? Do you live in a, a healthy built environment where there's spaces you can exercise, spaces where you can communicate with neighbors and, and not be socially isolated? Now, behaviors, we also know, are very important. Physical activity, we know that people who live longer and uh, have a longer health span, health, they're healthier for longer, they tend to be regular exercisers. We, and we know that we should exercise at least 30 minutes a day or at least uh, an hour several times a week with more intense activity. Those are the current recommendations. And it does seem to help. Now, diet is also very important. Um, you can see there's a picture of my brother here, my twin brother, uh, Craig, in, in Okinawa, where he lives and runs our centenarian study with Dr. Makoto Suzuki. Um, he's not at an ice cream truck. He's at a sweet potato truck. So people. Uh, in Okinawa tend to eat much healthier and that I believe has impacted their odds for healthy aging and longevity. Um, now we know that diet is very important because there have been many studies done all the way since the 1930s on this phenomenon called caloric or dietary restriction. So if you eat a, uh, a healthy diet and you just eat fewer calories, in other words, you're not nutritionally deficient in anything, but you just have a calorie deficit, you tend to live a heck of a lot longer in, uh, under these experimental conditions. There's been some studies done with humans that uh, are suggesting similar outcomes, but we don't have um, outcomes for longevity yet, because these would be very long studies. But we have uh, a study in progress at the University of Wisconsin, um, and there's a couple of other studies around the country that are funded by the National Institutes of Health, the National Institute on Aging that are looking at calorically restricted uh, monkeys. And you can see that these monkeys have been calorically restricted, at least one of them has, the fellow on the left, for almost 20 years. Now they're entering middle and old age. And you can see that the fellow on the right, who's had ad libitum access to food, looks a lot older. His body looks a little bit shrunken, osteoporotic. Uh, his eyes don't look as bright. He's got kind of a pop belly. His fur doesn't look as shiny, so he shows all the characteristics of aging, whereas the guy on the left, who's all he's done is eaten about a quarter fewer calories uh, over the course of his life, 
of his adult life, and he looks much younger. So we believe that this slows the aging process. Now, it's very difficult as humans. We're hardwired to eat as much as we can because we, almost, for almost all of human existence, we had to survive famines, we had to scrounge around for food, and we were lucky if we had enough calories. And now we live in an overabundance of calories. So it's um, uh, obviously not good to have too many calories. So what researchers are now discovering is that there are foods that contain compounds that we call caloric restriction mimetics. In other words, they mimic the effects of caloric restriction. Within these foods, we, we find um, particular compounds uh, like curcumin, astaxanthin, which is a carotenoid found in algae and salmon, um, catechins, which are found in green teas. So some of the foods on the previous slide contain uh, these compounds, and these compounds stimulate these caloric restriction biological pathways. I show a, one drug compound, prednisone, which as we know is a very strong steroid and a strong anti-inflammatory. You can see the chemical structures are somewhat similar with these natural compounds. Um, but the, the advantage of the natural compounds is they don't have the same deleterious effects of the, of the powerful anti-inflammatory drug. They are powerful anti-inflammatories, but they they, they don't have the same side effects. So there's a lot of promise with these caloric restriction mimetic nutraceuticals for potential for healthy aging longevity in humans. That's a big area of research. Now, I'd like to kind of end the talk here on a positive note because we've been talking about some things that we can do to help enhance our odds for healthy aging and longevity. And I'll show you how these things add up. Recently, we did a study with the Kuakini Honolulu Heart Program where we took uh, we looked at about 1,500 of our uh, aging men. They were, on average, age 75 years old. And we said, well, what are their odds of living to be 100? And you can see that, that on, on the slide, that there's uh, survival curves. And th these, the top survival curve, which is in blue, uh, is for the, the men that lived the longest. They survived the longest. And each successive curve below it is a group of men that had one risk factor, two risk factors, three, four, five or more risk factors. And what I mean by risk factors is we looked at things like, did you eat a healthy diet? Did you exercise regularly? Uh, do you have decent cholesterol levels? Do you have decent blood pressure? Is your blood sugar okay? Um, risk factors like that, and they tended to be additive. And ev for every one of those risk factors you had, your odds of living uh, longer diminished. And you can see that by the age of 90, if you had none of these major risk factors, in other words, you exercise regularly, you had a healthy diet, you didn't have high blood pressure, etc., you had about an 80% odds of living to be age 90. But by, by the time you had five or more of those risk factors, your odds were cut in half down to about 40%. So big, uh, big influence on your ability to achieve a healthy old age. Now, in conclusion, we believe that genes are very important for healthy aging and longevity. Uh, modifiable risk factors, such as diet, exercise, we also think are very important. We think they're additive. If you have health, good genes and you have a healthy lifestyle, it's additive effects on your, your odds to be living healthy and, and long. Uh, but obviously, more study is needed to better understand the mechanisms for healthy aging and longevity. And perhaps, if we optimize our odds, no matter what our genes, we can all uh, get close to what uh, Ushisan, one of our Okinawa centenarian study participants, has achieved at the age of 102 and still working in her garden. Again, my name is Dr. Bradley Wilcox, and thank you very much for listening.